This week's episode of The Clear Out was recorded on the 14th of November 2023 at home in Wicklow. And in it, I draw a connection between the current crisis, conflict in the Middle East and the travails of a lonely pop star. Yes, I am talking about what's happening in Israel and Palestine. And yes, I am talking about Robbie Williams. What could that connection be? What could that gurning pop star have in common with the state of Israel? Well, you know, keep listening and you'll find out. Um, so yeah, that's it. I mean, I, that's what's coming up. Um, if that doesn't pique your curiosity, nothing will. But yeah, it's got something to do with conflict. It's got something to do with damage. I think you know where I'm going with this. But keep listening to find out to find out more. I'll see you around the corner. Cheers. Ooh, not gonna change my mind. Leaving the dream behind. I keep my Hi, my name is Dara Clear and you're listening to the Clear Out. You're very welcome. Thank you for choosing this podcast, this episode. It's nice to have you here and I hope you're going to enjoy the ride. (laughs) Oh dear. So uh, another week, another week passes and we fetch up in mid-November. The year, I mean, six weeks left of the year. Is that fair? Is is it is it to say the year is drawing to a close? um, Is that is that slightly dramatic? It doesn't feel like it. It's it certainly feels that way to me. And um, you know, come back in two weeks, and we're knocking into December and the Christmas. The Christmas madness, which has begun already, but which I am resisting, uh, much to the frustration and disappointment of my daughter, that will, that will take over and dominate all. I, I bumped into a friend the other day. Uh, on the street, and it was, yeah, you know, just a nice kind of happenstance, a nice little. A nice little kind of, uh, yeah, serendipitous catch up and good to see her. Um, But she said something rather ominous, (laughs) which was, you know, that friends of hers in, um, I think the word she used was spiritual, kind of spiritual circles. What I took from that were maybe people who are wellness adjacent healthy lifestyle advocates maybe alternative medical practice advocates or practitioners um you know people who'd be trying to live their lives with a a certain amount of you know integrity and um sensitivity and mindfulness etc and my friend said all those people are warning her that bad times are coming and i just thought uh oh alarm bell i don't trust this and not you know not my friend i trust her but i was like what sort of a message is that like let's batten down the hatches let's let's prepare for some sort of onslaught now it wasn't the time to to push to push her on exactly what they were talking about but i just thought man if the if the hippies are saying bad times are coming <laughs> we're in trouble we're in trouble listen i'm a i'm a hippie in disguise um and i say well I was going to say everything's going to be grand. I don't think ever, I don't think everything is going to be grand. But I, I think basically, so much is about 
perspective so much is about what we choose to see and so much is about where we choose to put our energy and if we choose to put our energy into doom scapes and doom prophecies um and okay what the hell i'll throw in conspiracy <laughs> various kind of conspiracy prognosticators into that as well i mean if we choose to put our energy into those places of course of course we're going to feel like everything is doomed um and just just because you choose not just because you might choose not to put your energy into those places that doesn't mean you're in denial that doesn't mean you've swung you know to the other side of the the pendulum's arc it just means you're being mindful about where you put your energy and i think that's really important i mean if we're if we're talking about our personal our sense of personal well-being um we've got to be careful what we invite in and we've got to be careful where we where we establish strong connections um be careful about what we're allowing ourselves to be attracted to um i mean that, like that's a question all of its own i mean why why do we find certain ideas or personalities or you know whatever it might be why do we find them attractive why do we find certain practices attractive what is it about them that draws us to them um you know sometimes it's maybe not sometimes maybe always it it, it, it might be about a need um i mean i know a lot of my practice my personal practices are about a need for control a need for the illusion of control anyway um my attraction to you know a lot of my practices which revolve around sort of exercise and personal discipline that is it's definitely connected to my need to you know impose order on a chaotic world and to impose order on myself because it gives me a structure that allows me to feel safe and that's pretty much why i do the things i do um but that idea of what we're attracted to satisfying a need um you know sometimes that might be an unspoken conviction that we already have and we're looking for a valid a validation of that outside ourselves um you know maybe it's more organic than that um maybe it has something very integral to our life experience or you know our you know whatever stage we've reached in life pitches us into this area but i i was i just found it very striking i found it very striking what my friend said like it was a real um yeah it was like you know pull me in closer tell me tell me this tell me this secret tell me this wisdom that's going to make me feel scared and i'm i was yeah that's that that was the energy that's what it felt like and I'm, i was thinking to myself i don't want this this is not what i'm interested in and i don't believe that that's going to i don't believe investing in that area is going to make me feel particularly well um so yes today I, I, there's no conclusion to that there's no conclusion to that <laughs> were you waiting for it were you waiting for a conclusion um i'll just reiterate what i said before it's uh think think about where you're sending your energy think about why 
you might be drawn to things that are making or you know that that may be making you feel more anxious they may be making you feel less secure about the world uh, in which we find ourselves um you know there's part of me that feels that this is this is just an aspect of the human condition um and perhaps it's connected to i was going to say perhaps it's connected to age but my 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 sense is that you know young people are having increased levels of anxiety themselves so that would that would work against the idea that it's age like i was going to say as we get older we get more concerned um or we regard the world with greater seriousness um and with greater fear i suppose um but again my sort of larger arc in terms of how i view mental health and wellness and self-care is to i have a great belief in consciously consciously challenging that in in myself and consciously being alert to you know to 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 sources of of positivity to sources of um strength sources of reassurance seeking you know things that may renew my faith that people aren't going to completely you know destroy this planet we live on um and i feel at the moment with what's happening in in the middle east there's an increased there's an increased level of anxiety and and concern um and fear and dread and horror frankly um i I think a lot of people are horrified by what they're seeing um you know in 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 palestine and there's a sense of sort of despair fury rage disgust and i can't help but think that if israel was a person it's going to find itself with very few friends on the other side of this this moment um and maybe it doesn't care and i I wanted to talk a little bit about what's happening um in the middle east today uh, i don't want to you know I've, i'm not going to um or i have no interest in going deep into you know into the the, the you know the, the the history of this conflict um but there were just a couple of things this week that came across my path and it just got me thinking more about the the sort of psychological component of all of this and the the human psyche component of all of this and um there were a couple of things a couple of things that i came across in the last week that really confirmed some of my own beliefs um or my own suspicions my own instincts around i guess this sort of ultra zionism um and because because the people who were speaking were jewish themselves uh, one of whom was israeli it um 
for me it was a sort of a, a validation um, and it sort of you know legitimized their position um, I mean I, I, I kind of hesitate to speak on things of which I know very little and of which I've had no experience directly um, I leave that to sort of other people who have more authority um, and credibility in those areas but I came across a clip of an Israeli journalist his name is Gideon Levy and he was laying out um, he was laying out a sort of an, an, an argument for why in the Israeli mentality and you know the Israeli psyche there's such a um, you know such a sort of a, a palpable presence of um, superiority I suppose or entitlement um, or self-justification and you know basically what you know the, the two kind of main things that jumped out at me were one Israelis are basically the only sort of occupying force of a territory that were victims so obviously coming out of the second world war the holocaust and then waiting for the you know the, the Balfour agreement which ratified the the state of Israel um that was the sort of you know the, the birthplace of all you know of this kind of 20th century into the 21st century conflict um but Israelis have a mentality of you know we're the victims here um and they you know alongside that and this is again according to this journalist alongside that they you know view palestinians as 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 lesser um and they they've dehumanized palestinians um and therefore that there's no sort of humanistic imperative to respect the rights of palestinians um and it's it's just a it's just a lethal a lethal combination um and the second we get into that territory of of dehumanizing someone it's you know the act of doing that dehumanizes the person who does it as well um because my belief is the you know the only thing that kind of potentially redeems us as you know as, as human animals is our our shared humanity of course that's a that's a very particular term isn't it <laughs> You know, because you could argue our shared humanity is everything that's wrong with humans as well. All our venality and selfishness and destructiveness and immorality and amorality, um, brutality, etc. That's our shared humanity as well. But when we use that phrase, I don't think that's what we're thinking of. We're thinking of something more compassionate, more considerate, more mutually um cognizant of of shared you know fundamental shared values um which is probably an understanding of it's probably an understanding of you know principles connected to you know to community family love uh, ritual um you know you know fear um you know the celebration of identity um you know and, and culture and history um and i i i i always think an understanding of the journey of of surviving through life 
like a very existential recognition that you know life is a bumpy path um like i think that's that's a connecting experience but when we lose sight of that when we lose sight of the the travails of the individual and i mean i spoke about this um a couple of months ago i think about the whole idea of when we treat others in a monolithic way we we rob them of their individuality we rob them of their you know their more nuanced complex identity we rob them of their personality um and re- reduce them to a set of assumptions and that of course in itself is a is a, is a dehumanizing act and i i've no time for that um i mean except for hipsters and real estate agents um they can <laughs> I, I better speak carefully lest I, I start a, a hate campaign. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's... The, the, the sort of... St- I, 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 I'm not sure what the word is I'm, I'm looking for here. But we we only save... Or, or, or keep safe, maintain our humanity by recognizing the humanity of others. I really think it's as, it's as simple as that. And I think, you know, a few weeks ago, when this latest conflict started after the, the terrorist attacks, um, in in Israel I didn't say much about it and I, all I said was I sort of I, I kind of said like I, I've never I feel like I've never not understood where the Israelis are coming from um, because it's it, it you know it's the great wound um, it's the great wound of the you know the second world war the the final solution the holocaust the concentration camps um and that the the terrible things that were done while the rest of the world looked away or chose to believe that it wasn't happening um you know I, i never lose my sense of awareness of that as a starting point just to understand it, to rationalize it and go, okay, so um, no one is ever going to be more of a victim um, than the, you know, the Jewish race, if, they, if, you know, if, if, if that's not too crude a term. Um, you know, speaking of, you know, speaking of people in a monolithic way. Um, but it's it, it you know it, it doesn't justify everything that's happened since and i think like that's how i view what's happening in you know you know in the in the middle east and it's how i view is israel's response i think they are dehumanizing themselves when they shut themselves off from from empathy from compassion and they lose their own humanity in in what is now becoming, I think, in very unequivocal terms, a genocide uh, in Palestine. Um, and it, it, it's 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 absolutely disgusting. And it's you know it's going to be to Israel's you know eternal shame that you know they are doing to others what was done to them i mean it's it's i don't i don't think that's a i don't think that's a clumsy comparison um and others have expressed that far more articulately 
and eloquently than I just have. And one of those people was a British MP, a Labour MP called Gerald Kaufman. Kaufman, Kaufman, K-A-U-F-M-A-N. Um, he died in 2017. He was a Labour MP in England and he was an English, uh, an English Jew of Polish parentage. And there is a clip um, that you can find online um, where he speaks for five minutes um, in very unambiguous terms and is utterly condemnatory of Israel's actions um, in Palestine and you know Gaza, the West Bank. Um, and it's it's well worth seeking out um, if you can find it. I'm not sure when it was. I guess it was towards the end of his political career. He died when he was 86, as I said, in 2017. But he speaks about his own sort of Jewish bona fides, if you like, um, and his, you know, his relationship with different Israeli prime ministers and political figures down through history um, and his connection to his, you know, citizens of Israel um, but he he said something that I hadn't heard expressed as um, as kind of starkly before, which was fundamentally that uh, Israel has exploited or capitalized on the kind of the guilt of Gentiles over the Holocaust, and the implication was that you know Israel were kind of getting a free pass and that non-Jewish people were willing to kind of go oh well look what you know look at that terrible terrible historical event that happened to them um you know we'll just stay quiet i suppose so i just found those two speakers gideon uh gideon levy um who was speaking at a kind of oh, national oh, national press association that's what it was um, laying out like this is why the Israeli mindset isn't going to change because these are the fundamental positions that are absolutely hardwired in the Israeli mentality uh, so between him and then Gerald Kaufman's uh, five minute breakdown of the sort of immorality of Israeli occupation and uh, aggressive occupation of you know of, of of territory in you know in you know in israel in palestinian territory um it, it, you know it's I, I i personally find very inspiring i find it very inspiring very moving and i just believe that they're right and that's it i just kind of go yeah i this is correct <laughs> their assessment their how they're describing things it just seems to make sense to me um and it's purely a criticism of the israeli state as opposed to and i spoke with this the other week as opposed to a criticism of jewish people or a rejection of judaism or the Jew, you know of jewish people jewish faith jewish culture like none of those things are in the mix and um it's yeah it's um more people i think need to be saying that and you know i'm i'm very relieved that ireland has maintained its position of being quite outspoken in this area historically and a supporter of palestine historically and they're continuing to do so ireland is continuing to do so and um i think there is great sort of moral credibility in that position and the opposite of moral credibility um when that position isn't isn't there when this sort of hedging prevaricating equivocating stance is there and in fact another great clip i saw this week online you may have seen it yourself was from the um irish member of european parliament claire daly who absolutely lambasted Ursula von der Leyen um, in the EU um, and just 
yeah, the, the, the expression that comes to mind is uh, tore her a new one <laughs> and just launched into her and said she had blood on her hands for the position she took the second the terrorist attack happened to align herself with Israel. Um, and that basically said, yeah, you've got blood on your hands. The blood of Palestinian children is on your hands. Um, and her her parting comment was, the Hague isn't good enough for you. Was that what it was? The Hague's too good for you. Sorry. The Hague is too good for you. Um, and just blisteringly um, indignant, righteous, uh, you know, a blisteringly indignant and righteous takedown of Ursula van der Leyen. And I thought, yeah, again, I've got I've nothing but sympathy for this position. I think you're absolutely right. I was astonished when Ursula van der Leyen of the of the EU took that position immediately. It felt. I I, I just I, I was asking myself if there was a precedent for that. It just felt so um, wrong-headed and politically provocative and seemed to me to demonstrate a complete lack of care or understanding for the the volatility of the the, the, you know, the historical relationship between Israel and Palestine. Um, and for her to just be like, oh yeah, well, we're all with Israel. It's like, what? You can't, you can't do that. You, you can't do that in that position representing the member states of the EU. Um, anyway. But look, sorry, I didn't mean to spend so long on that. Do go and seek out those clips if you're interested at all. Um, but here's the thing, right? I'm going I'm to draw a very bizarre connection. It may seem bizarre to you, not to me. Otherwise, I wouldn't be making it. Did you see? <laughs> did, you, did you see? Have you watched or have you come across the Robbie Williams documentary? on netflix um because i'm seeing a connection between <laughs> robbie williams and this conflict in the middle east and the israeli mindset and basically okay i don't know why you wouldn't know who robbie williams is if you're if you're listening to this but robbie williams is, is uh, a singer musician entertainer who was in the English boy band Take That who were at the peak of their powers in the in the 90s and Robbie Williams famously got kicked out of or left that boy band and went on to have a stratospheric solo career um, through the sort of late late 90s early 2000s it was probably his apex and um that's kind of 20 years ago and anyway there's a documentary out um on netflix and funny enough like this comes hot on the heels of the david beckham documentary a few weeks ago another sort of iconic english 90s you know figure um and you know both of those documentaries are quite um is it hagiographic? How, how, do you, how do you pronounce that? <laughs> I feel like every other episode I'm going, how do you pronounce that? They're both very sort of pro their subjects. Let's put it that way. Now, I started watching the Robbie Williams documentary and just thought, okay, Grant, I'll, I'll, I'll have a look at this. I, I, you know, I've no history with Robbie Williams. I've no history with boy bands in general. Um, so I mean I couldn't even tell you I, I wouldn't even be able to name you uh, a Take That song um, I remember the youngest brother of good friends of mine used to gleefully play the music of Westlife 
who were the the second big boy band to emerge in Ireland after after Boyzone. Um, and again, I'm not sure I could name a single song by either of those bands. But this youngest brother of these friends of mine, I'd, I'd be spending time in my sort of mid-twenties. I was kind of spending time at their house quite a bit, the family home. I'd share, share a room with the youngest brother, who would have been late teens. Had he, I'm not even sure if he left school at that stage. But he'd be like deliriously, uh, you know, grinning as he played Westlife. And he just seemed to be in on the joke that this is kind of ridiculous that I'm listening to this boy band, you know, talking about himself. But his enjoyment only increased when he saw how 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 much I was not enjoying the experience. Um, but anyway, that's a that's just an aside. So. What I, what I remember was like Robbie Williams had the, you know, I just thought, oh, yeah, like he's he's got these kind of great pop songs and he's got this sort of leering gurning swagger that i i don't know i i found it i don't remember at the time just kind of, i found it kind of hard to take my eyes off him like you know like he was kind of freakishly um pugnacious and obnoxious um and yet kind of attractive within it like he was sort of in on the joke like this is absurd but i'm just going to be so in your face um and the songs were good i thought uh no i never bought an album um but and and that was it and then i don't know robbie williams kind of went away <laughs> But so I, I kind of sat down to watch this documentary series the other night and I was like, oh, this, this might be okay. This might be sort of interesting to see what is, you know, where he's at now. And, you know, I, I go into these things in good faith, thinking, huh, you know, these guys are roughly my age and have had, you know, enormous success. Um, You know, I wonder where they're at on their journey. I wonder what, like, what revelations they have to share um and i give them the benefit of the doubt now i was i was predisposed to liking beckham for some reason i wasn't a man united fan um but i i, I kind of liked him every time i saw him like interviewed I, I always felt he came across quite well and i found i, I always felt he was quite genuine so again with robbie williams I didn't even have that, but I, I was curious. I was curious, and there, there was a kind of a turning point in the documentary series. I think in the third episode, where I just felt, uh, this isn't, um, this isn't going to be what I, 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 I hoped it might be, and. Sure enough, as the documentary series went on, I just got more kind of confirmation of that. Um, and so ultimately it wasn't that, I didn't find it that satisfying or that interesting. And yet there is something interesting to take away from it. So fundamentally what I'm talking about is Robbie Williams has, you know, a, a sort of a, a poor me story. Like he was the youngest member of the boy band. He had a lot of issues. The The fame came fast and hard and huge. And he, you know, was coping with, you know, drugs and drink. And then he got clean. Um, and then he had, a, you know, relapse later in his career when he was, um, you know, solo and just being overwhelmed by the pressure. Um, but he had... He had a you know he had a great sort of colleague and partner and songwriting partner uh, I think producer who was you know with whom he was kind of really tight a guy called Guy Chambers and I mean I remember that at the time going oh yeah this isn't just Robbie Williams this is Guy Chambers as well and Guy Chambers in this documentary 
Um, there was no interview with him. And the, the, the basically the format of the documentary is Robbie Williams in his very nice house, you know, in, in the States, I guess, L.A. or someplace. Um, Robbie Williams being shown all this footage from his career and his life. You know, a lot of footage that was taken by Guy Chambers when they were recording or on holidays. Um, other footage from TV and interviews and performances. And it's footage that, you know, according to the documentary makers, Robbie Williams hasn't seen. So it's basically Robbie Williams looking at a, a video diary of his life um, and, you know, watching himself grow up on, you know, someone's personal camera, camcorder, whatever. Um, and in the public eye and you know you're basically you're looking at somebody sort of getting to see themselves at various stages of you know maturity immaturity various stages of personal crisis stages of great success stages of uh, addiction and alcoholism um, you know st stages of kind of you know mania personal chaos um and watching robbie williams watch himself you kind of can see you know i felt his own you know his pain was quite palpable at times and his own sense of of past suffering was very palpable and his sort of his empathy for himself was quite palpable which i thought was quite nice um but i kept waiting for him to sort of express something insightful or reflective and he he never really did you know he's kind of quite glib about a lot of it. And if he wasn't being glib, he was just being a little bit, you know, he's been kind of quite morose. Um, but there came a point in the, you know, in his in his life where he decided, no, this is, this isn't about me enough. I need to go out on my own, truly on my own, because Guy Chambers gets, it's kind of, you know, get, I guess getting too much credit. Uh, that'll, be, that'll be my take on it. And so this, great friendship ends when Robbie Williams says I'm going on without you and we never see Guy Chambers again and Guy Chambers in the footage comes across really well it comes across very sort of grounded normal very musical very talented um, and you know it, it seemed clear from the footage that this was a really important person to Robbie Williams and that the, the friendship, the bond, the brotherhood was really, really authentic and true and important. Um, and Robbie Williams says how he just said, you know, we're done. And he, he I think he said that guy Chambers just melted. Um, and then he just kind of moves on and he's like, yeah, no, there's nothing there now. And I was like, what? I don't believe this. <laughs> I don't believe it. Um, and another person who came out well in the footage, totally unexpectedly, was Jerry Halliwell. Unexpected to me. I, I don't know anything about Jerry Halliwell other than she was uh, a Spice Girl. Uh, you know, again, the, the kind of the definitive girl group from the 90s in England and part of that sort of cool Britannia that mid 90s explosion of British confidence that coincided with um, it coincided with the, the arrival of New Labour and Tony Blair and Britpop, the great rivalry between Oasis and Blur, um, the, 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 the Euros, the European kind of soccer competition in 96, you know, and I was in England at the time. That's how I went over to England in 96 to begin my acting training. I was there for a couple of years training. And yeah, like times were good and the English were really feeling themselves. <laughs> you know, and, you know, the Spice Girls were really at the, you know, at the heart of the zeitgeist with these other, those other things I mentioned. And uh, Jerry Halliwell, also known as Ginger Spice, 
she was one of the uh, the five members of that group but she and Robbie Williams had a, a you know a scene a relationship um, and that features prominently I think in the second episode of the documentary series and yeah I, I, I couldn't get over sort of how how well she came across and again these are this is archive footage she, she's not interviewed no one's interviewed for the whole thing and that is yeah kind of strange um but what you see in the footage she just seemed really i don't know comfortable in her own skin maybe she wasn't but that's the impression i got i just thought she said oh she just seems really nice <laughs> and robbie williams seems insecure and manic um and kind of desperate uh and it's you know it's sad but the you know ultimately when that moment came in this in the in the documentary where he's like yeah guy chambers is kind of dead to me like that was the vibe and i thought what the hell is this and then you know he gets he gets to go back and be with take that um you know the kind of the remounted take that you know second bite at the the the, the what you get a second bite of the cherry the apple <laughs> um and that was fine and he sort of refound his mojo with take that having had a three-year layoff and then take that gave him the confidence to go back and you know be a solo artist again and you know continue to have you know big sellout performances and all the rest um but yeah and then sorry and then he, you know he meets his wife in america and now they've got a few kids and that's all great and that seems you know he seems very happy with all of that but at the end of the whole thing you're kind of coming away going i don't know if robbie williams has empathy for anybody else like there was no outward generosity about anybody else he didn't seem to have any love kind of going outwards towards anybody else apart from his wife and his kids which is fine and there was the one moment in the whole thing that made me kind of tear up a little bit was towards the very end of the documentary he has to leave the family because he's going on tour and his daughter who's probably similar age to my daughter is just weeping as she's hugging him goodbye and i was very moved by that because i felt his connection with her seemed very real and nice and lovely um i just thought well that's it like he just wants he's just like a family guy and he wants to be there with his wife and kids and there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever i mean i admire that i value that that that's close to you know you know it's one of the most important things in my own life but i kind of came away from it going this is a guy who didn't once refer to his family who didn't once talk about his mother and father who didn't once talk about why he was so chaotic as a young man who didn't once talk about the you know where he came from um he never really tried to explain anything he, he you know he spoke about the pressure of fame um and he spoke about the you know the, the paparazzi and that featured heavily in the david beckham documentary as well um and all of that was kind of just the circumstances of fame and then the the kind of the i suppose in, you know the imposter syndrome that went with that and then the lack of love he felt from british media and newspapers and tabloids who just went after him relentlessly uh which seemed to be the you know the nature of how british tabloids operated um they just were really mercenary and kind of vile um so i had, I had sympathy for all of that but by the end of the by the end of that sh the, the documentary i found myself just kind of going i'm not sure he's that likable and again not a crime <laughs> you're allowed to not be likable but the you know the, the the impression was of someone who's just completely completely self-involved um and no one can feel sorrier for robbie williams than robbie williams um and i i've no issue with robbie williams having demons i've no issue with robbie williams having mental health issues i have sympathy for that um 
but it's I suppose my conclusion was that this is this is just damage personified and this is unresolved it's unresolved stuff he's found a safe place and he's found a safe mode of behavior and he's found a relationship in which he feels safe and all of that is is brilliant um and yeah and good luck to him um but that's somebody and here i'm going to bring it back to the middle east and israel that's somebody who can't escape the originating wound and can't even articulate it and didn't um and has basically just pushed people away um that you know that's the impression i got from the documentary i mean you know watch it yourself and see what you think but i just felt like all right yeah there's you know there's nobody else here um he has no sort of sustained by the looks of it there's no sustained kind of nourished nurturing relationships in his life um and there doesn't seem to be much he doesn't seem to have a relationship with the kind of the collateral damage of that or much care um there seems to be an absence of empathy um and again another clip i saw this week was of the israeli ambassador in england being interviewed on channel four uh, i think it was channel four or bbc basically saying i have no empathy for palestinians um and then she tried to backpedal said no i didn't say no empathy i said i had no sympathy but she did say i had no i have no empathy um and so for me the 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 the, the tissue that connects robbie williams international pop star in his mansion in la and israel and Israeli and Israeli foreign policy in Palestine is this this inability to escape the wound, um, and I think that that's I think I just think that that's so I think that's so profoundly human um, and terribly sad. Um, I don't find it hard to understand uh, but it's you know it's the ultimate sort of it, it leads to the ultimate sort of self-preserving behavior which usually involves completely shutting everybody else out when you can only focus on self um at the expense of all other relationships uh, you know virtually all other relationships um i mean i i recognize that impulse i recognize that that, that sort of that breakdown of of trust or or faith in everyone else <laughs> i understand you know i i can i kind of recognize the germ of that feeling where i just want to close the door on the world and go i'll just be here with my my wife and daughter and we'll survive and everyone else can go to hell <laughs> but that's um you know that's uh, that's extreme isn't it and so i think there's a there's a middle ground where you can just kind of do that on occasion and it's lovely <laughs> and then get back out in the world and engage with other people with fellow travelers um through this through this ongoing challenge um this thing that we call existence and your know, life in the 21st century um but i think um yeah what 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 i was thinking about one one final thought on this i'm going to i'm going to wrap up soon enough 
I think one final thought on this. Um, I mean, and it's okay. Like the, the the idea of the originating wound, the defining wound. I I I really do believe that's in a lot of us, um, and it's our. It's a great challenge, I think, for any individual to overcome that wound. And I mean, last week I spoke about Sylvester Stallone, and clearly his great wound was having an abusive father, a violent father. And a father who was competitive with him and pushed him away and always tried to keep him down and dominate him. And um that's a you know, that's that's very, very strong stuff. Um and I, I did come across this um online recently. Um uh, a psychologist, a female psychologist, I was speaking about her recently enough on the on the podcast. And she was talking about the, you know, the, the, the power of the father wound when a father is a damaging element in one's life, how destructive that is to somebody's psyche, to their self-worth, their, their, their self-identity. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's a huge thing that was specifically to do with, you know, fathers, but I think in general, Many of us feel that there's a you know an originating wound, and I mean I can certainly go back in my life and think of certain episodes or moments with different people where I was really you know hurt or you know rejected or you know offended or you know made you know made to feel small, um, and I don't have to I don't have to kind of travel far in my mind to go oh yeah and I remember that vividly <laughs> and you know it's easy to kind of still to still access uh, you know an angry response to that um, and you know access my sort of indignation and maybe even uh, a desire for revenge um, but I sort of recognize it for, for, for what it is. Um, and I try to kind of contextualize it and go, okay, well, that's where I was then. That wouldn't hit me in the same place now. And, you know, for that, I'm grateful because that's recovery, that's progress, that's perspective, it's experience, it's maturation. Um, and it's also peacemaking. Um and making peace with that part of myself, the hurt part of myself, the angry part of myself. I mean, and that does return us to the Middle East. Um, and you can only make peace by seeking it. Uh, and you can't seek peace by bombing the shit out of people and bombing children. And, you know, it, that is not that is not the avenue to peace. Peace has to be you know it has to be sought by non-violent means um again something that i brought up earlier uh you know this year in another episode you know you've got to leave your weapons outside it's like the old wild west saloon leave your guns at the door you're coming in here to sit down and, and you know try and relax um yeah but one thing i was thinking one other aspect of this that i was thinking about regarding the idea of the the you know the, the public face the the forward facing um persona the forward facing aspect of ourselves if the distance between our private self and our public self is too great I think that's a very perilous dynamic. If you have to travel so far from, let's call it your real self, your authentic self, if you have to travel really far from there to get to the person that walks out the door, to get to the person that interacts with other people in a work environment, a social environment, getting out and about in the world environment, that's about as broad a definition as you can get. 
if that journey is so far it's I think there's an inherent fragility to it and I think it's a fragility that has to bear a terrible burden it's a fragility that has to bear the the burden of functionality is the word that's coming to mind I don't think that's quite what I mean but the burden of presenting a version of yourself that you think is going to be the most successful in the world um, and if that persona or that version of yourself is really really far away from how you truly feel about yourself that's that's going to create conflict it's going to create tension and it's going to create I think unbelievable levels of fatigue as you revert from one to the other that journey back and forth is going to be absolutely enervating it's going to wring every drop of energy out of you in a very existential way um and my the sort of the wellness principle i take from that and i have iterated this before in one form or another the wellness principle I take away from that is the closer you can bring those two selves together, the more confident you'll be. Because there's no disparate selves, there's no separation. So the closer you can be to the private self you know if hopefully you're comfortable with the private self I mean that's where you know you might need to do work you might need to seek the help of a professional you might need to really go well hold on my private self is you know an absolute disaster <laughs> so, you know my, my private self means I have to step out in the world and just be you know totally I don't know you know vulnerable raw naked but see, there's great, there's great strength to be taken from that if you can find the courage, if it's safe to do so. I'm not saying don't be safe. I mean, tread carefully. You know, move carefully. Mind yourself. Hold yourself carefully. But, you know, if things are as bad as that, seek help, I think, is the, you know, is part of that solution. But ultimately, we want to be able to step out and go, no, this is who I am. And this is how I am. And this is how I'm going to be. And, and this is the fundamental part. I'm good with this. I'm good with this, who I am. And I'm happy to present this wherever I go. And if you can do that within no, you know, normal modes and norms of, of, of social behavior, of workplace behavior. I think that's a recipe for real strength and clarity of, of living. Um, and that's, you know, I, 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 t <laughs> I fail constantly but that's sort of my own personal aspiration is to to try to live that way where you know wherever i am and who you know whomever i'm with that's 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 you know what you're getting is what everyone else is getting um but as i say i mean it's you know that's I fail at that constantly in you know in different ways but you know I'm not a million miles away from it and 
that just might be to do with I don't know I, I, I don't think it is to do with age I mean like that's not that's not accidental that's conscious and practiced um, and habitual you know and it's a reason I can do this it's a reason I can sit at this mic once a week and produce this show this tell and speak about the things I speak about in a way that I I believe is authentic and intelligible and relatable and occasionally insightful I'm not saying there all the time but maybe sometimes um, and part of that to come back to the idea of conflict and resolution part of that is I've been quite successful at making peace with myself and you know that's a form of acceptance that's accepting the existence of conflict and that's inviting in internalized forgiveness because because of course the you know the the the, the damaged child <laughs> and I think many of us I said this last week as well, I think. I think many of us do feel we are damaged children. But the damaged child always feels like they've done something wrong. And that they've failed. And that they're not good enough. Um, and so to forgive... To forgive the judging internal voice that accompanies that sense of inadequacy... Is, is a huge part of succeeding as an adult. And I think as I as I near ever closer to my 50th birthday, I think I consider myself an adult now in life. <laughs> I have for a while. I'm only joking. Okay, listen, that's it. That's all I've got. That's all I've got uh, today. Um, I hope uh, I hope this this journey was okay for the past hour um i hope it gave you something to think about i hope i hope it chimed with you on some level um because i do i do hope that the the podcast is is relatable i hope it you do yeah i hope when you do listen you go yeah that makes sense or i feel that too um because if it's not doing that I don't know if there's much point in it Um, because it's not meant to be just me licking myself for an hour on the mic (laughs) 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 like uh, you know like a like a cat yeah just um, just put the mic there I'm just gonna clean myself for an hour this is gonna be gold (laughs) I taste amazing okay i'm gone have um have a lovely week i'll be back next week with something else and um you'll find various bits and pieces on social media um the the receptive mind mindfulness and energy flow positivity classes breathwork classes I've been postponed for a week so they were meant to be starting uh, well at the time this comes out they were meant to be starting yesterday but they're going to be starting on November the 22nd Um, that's a Wednesday that'll be Wednesday of next week 11am at Camerino Bakery in Emma the Irish Museum of Modern Art in Kilmainham and that's a drop in class come in for an hour do some breath work with me some energy management some energy flow uh, I guarantee you, you will feel better on the other side of it. So um, keep an eye out for that on social media. And you know, if you're in that area, come in, do a class, do a session, um, say hello. And I'll be delighted to have you there. And yeah, otherwise, just keep an eye on social media. I'm in all the usual places. Um, if you really enjoy this thing that I do, you can support me on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash the clear out and for the price of a cup of coffee a cup of tea a sandwich a pint 
you can support this and validate it and i'd be really grateful for that kind of validation as well as just nice things being said and shared uh, commented upon rated reviewed you can do all that stuff as well so that's it i will talk to you next week thank you so much for listening i really appreciate you spending this time with me stay safe uh, stay mindful stay peaceful for god's sake stay peaceful if you can be peaceful with yourself And yes, as always, mind yourselves. I'll talk to you soon. Cheers. Bye.